Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Gopi Jadavalava Giri Varadhadi Gopi Jadavalava Giri Varadhadi Yes, so the Nandana, Prajajana, Randana. Yes, so the Nandana, Prajajana, Randana. Jamuna Tira Banachari. Jamuna Tira Banachadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Mao Vishnu Paraya Krishna Prasad Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nichanamani Namaste Saraswati Vive Govani Pachani Yavasesha Sunivani Pachade Sajani Excuse me. Is anyone here for the first time? Never been here before? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, <coughs> hope you have a good experience. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is
name is Pavamana. Um, I joined the temple in Los Angeles in 1972, so I've been, been around for a while. So read from uh, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2. Text number 13, I think some of you know this verse. Uh, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Dehi nosmin yata dehe, nosmin yata dehe, komaram jovanam jara, komaram jovanam jara, tata dehantara praptir, tiras tatra namuyati. Translation As the embodied soul continually passes in this body, from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. Purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. Since every living entity is an individual soul, each is changing his body at every moment, manifesting sometimes as a child, sometimes as a youth, and sometimes as an old man. Yet the same spirit soul is there and does not undergo any change. This individual soul finally changes the body at death and transmigrates to another body. And since it is sure to have another body in the next birth, either material or spiritual, there was no cause for lamentation by Arjun on account of death, neither for Bhishma nor for Drona for whom he was so much concerned. Rather, he should rejoice for their changing bodies from old to new ones, thereby rejuvenating their energy. Such changes of body account for varieties of enjoyment or suffering according to one's work in life. So Bhishma and Drona, being noble souls, were uh, uh, noble souls were surely going to have spiritual bodies in their next life, or at least life in heavenly bodies for superior enjoyment of material existence. So in either case, there was no cause of lamentation. Any man who has perfect knowledge of the constitution of the individual soul, the super soul, and nature, both material and spiritual, is called a dira, or a most sober man. Such a man is never deluded by the change of bodies. The Mayavadi theory of oneness of the spirit soul cannot be entertained on the ground that the spirit soul cannot be cut into pieces as a fragmental portion. Such cutting into different individual souls would make the supreme cleavable or changeable against the principle of the supreme souls being unchangeable. As confirmed in the Gita, the fragmental portions of the supreme exist eternally, sanatan, and are also called chara, that is, they have a tendency to fall down into material nature. These fragmental portions are eternally so, and even after liberation, the individual soul remains the same fragmental. But once liberated, he lives an eternal life in bliss and knowledge with the personality of Godhead. The theory of reflection can be applied to the supersoul who is present in each and every individual body and is known as the Paramatma. He is different from the individual living entity. When the sky is reflected in water, the reflections represent both the sun and moon and the stars also. The stars can be compared to the living entities and the sun or the moon to the Supreme Lord. The individual fragmental spirit soul is represented by Arjun, and the Supreme Soul is the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. They are not on the same level, as it will be apparent in the beginning of the fourth chapter. If Arjun is on the same level with Krishna, and Krishna is not superior to Arjun, then their relationship of instructor and instructed becomes meaningless. If both of them are deluded by the illusory energy, Maya, 
then there's no need of one being the instructor and the other the instructed. Such instruction would be useless because in the clutches of Maya, no one can be an authoritative instructor. Under the circumstances, it is admitted that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord, superior in position to the living entity Arjuna, who is a forgetful, deluded soul, deluded by Maya. So this is a very important verse, uh, and Srila Prabhupada spoke on it many times, that we are different from our body. Um, in the last, I'm going to say, two days ago, um, this fact for me personally um, was very poignantly experienced by me because a very dear friend of mine had passed away. And I had to go there to help the family. And only less than a few days before that, I, I saw him. And you know, he was still conscious and we had an exchange. So what's the difference between a live body and a dead body? Is there any class in college anywhere that teach the actual difference between a live body and a dead body? Of course, someone can say, well, you know, he, he's, he was breathing, and, you know, he has life symptoms. And, yeah, but what is it? What is it that isn't there when someone dies and a few moments before was there? Okay, the scientists don't really know what it is. Okay, and I'm not dissing any scientists out there, but the, the spiritual particle, Prabhupada wrote a book on it, is not material. The spirit soul is extremely small, so it can't be seen. But we, can, we know from symptoms of life that there is something. Okay, so what that something is, okay, that's a, a matter of study. Okay, and... Krishna is explaining things to Arjuna in this book, the Bhagavad Gita. Are you familiar with Bhagavad Gita? Did you? Yeah? Okay. Bhagavad Gita means the song of God. That's the translation. So Krishna, the same, we have a deity or, or figure of Krishna on the altar. He's wearing blue in the middle of the altar there. 5,000 years ago, Krishna was on our planet. He, the God himself, there's only one God, okay? And he has millions of names, and one of his names is Krishna, okay? So it just happens that Krishna and his friend, Arjuna, had a conversation, a very profound conversation, and it just happened to be on a battlefield. Arjuna was a warrior. He was probably the best warrior on the planet, except for one other, which was his older brother, Karna. That's another story. So the whole Bhagavad Gita was this conversation between Krishna and Arjuna. And so in the beginning, just as the battle is about to begin, there, the, the, there's a whole back story, and there's an epic uh, uh, literature called the Mahabharat, which is the history of greater India. So this story of le leading up to the Bhagavad Gita, this is the important part of the Mahabharat. The whole story, of the backstory of how what led up to this particular point is just to get people interested, to draw you into the story, all the intrigue and the love and the fighting and the, you know, the, all these kinds of things that people are interested in. They're stories. Okay? So before the speaking, uh, as the Bhagavad Gita was spoken, Arjuna and his five brothers were supposed to inherit the throne to be the rulers of the world, okay? Well, nowadays we have, you know, the, the, the world order, right? New world order, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
5,000 years ago, there was a ruling family, and they ruled the whole planet. And all the other kings, there were other kings, were subordinate. Anything that the ruling family from India, the, the, the dwelling where they lived is still there in India, in Old Delhi, and the, those who are familiar with that. And what happened was that there were some demons in this extended family, and by intrigue, they had stolen the rulership of the world. And on the pretense of getting their kingdom back, these five brothers amassed an army, and they were about to fight their cousins um, in a fratricidal war. Okay. And so in this process of amassing an army, uh, Krishna was also present at that time. And so Ar Arjun came to see Krishna one day in the morning. And the leader of the other army, because they were part of the same family, also came to see Krishna. And as it happened, uh, Krishna saw Arjun first. He said, oh, well, what, do you, what, what brings you here? And Arjun says, well, you know, we're fighting this war, so wondering if you could, if you could help. He said, well, I have my, my army, or you can have, have just me, and I, I won't fight. So Arjun was a great devotee of Krishna, and he, he said to Krishna, he said, I don't need your army. I'll take you. So his enemy, his, his cousin, whose name was Duryodhan, was elated. Wow. So Krishna, can I have your army? Sure. Well, go ahead. You can have my army. Vast army. Okay. So the Arjuna's family was only five brothers, and on the other side, there was a hundred. And it was not a, from, a, from an ordinary point of view, it was a turkey shoot. They had no chance. Arjun's army, they were like one-tenth. They, they, they could not have won. Okay. But they had Krishna on their side. And Krishna said, I'm not going to fight. In fact, tell you what I'll do. I'll drive your chariot. Right? Have you ever heard the, the, the movie, The Legend of Bagger Vance? Maybe you've heard this movie. Okay. Um, there was a book that was inspired from Bhagavad Gita, and that book, the, the movie, came from that, from that book. Okay, so kind of like that, you have a caddy, you know, carrying the golf clubs for the, for the golfer, and he's giving some tips and advice, you know, how, you know, what club do you, whatever it is, okay. So in this battle that was just about to begin, Krishna is giving advice to Arjun, okay who happened to be, it was, he was known as the greatest warrior in the world. Unbeknownst to most of the, of the people, his older brother was also there, who was actually a greater fighter. But that's another story. So there's a lot of backstories that led up to this particular, what they call the Battle of Kurukshetra. Okay. In the middle of nowhere. It's a battlefield, in the middle of a big open field, huge place away from the people in general. It wasn't fought, you know, like we have wars nowadays in, a, you know, in Lebanon where they go door to door or house to house, shoot people that are innocent and all that. Okay, no, this is huge armies, you know, facing each other in a big battlefield. Okay. So at that time, um, it, because it was a family affair, some and all over the world, just like a world war, they make alliances, alliances with people. Okay, so each side al were allied with various other kingdoms and, and kings and whatever, and so they all lined up on this battlefield. And 
just as the battle is about to begin, Arjuna tells Krishna, said, you know what, can you bring me to the front, you know, up to the front line where I can, you know, kind of see who I'm fighting, who, you know, who's, 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 uh, you know, just kind of a overview. So Krishna pulls up the chariot and says, well, here's your grandfather, and here's your teacher, and here are your cousin brothers, and here, you know, here's your fam this family member, and, and, and your guru, and this and that. Like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. These are all my friends. These are the people I grew up with. These are my family members. There's my guru. This is my grandfather. And they're on the other side. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to do this. And he says, uh, um, I, don't I don't think I want to do this. Because if, even if we win, well, who's going? To, who? How are, how are we going to enjoy? We're killing all the people that we enjoyed life with. Why? Why are you? Indu why do you want me to do all these things? And besides that, it, you know, if all these warriors are killed, their wives won't have anybody to protect them, and you know, the, they may uh, have unwanted children, and it'll cause havoc in society. He brought all kinds of, you know, good. Arguments, why not to fight a war? So um, this is how the battle, uh, just before the battle, this is the conversation that begins that Krishna is talking to Arjun. Okay? And in this conversation, he goes over all the important knowledge that people need to know as human beings. Basically, the, the cliff notes on how to live life, okay? How to, what to do, what not to do, how to understand things in the proper perspective, okay? So from all the arguments that Arjuna was giving to Krishna, from a mundane point of view, yeah, very good, okay? Um, our spoils will be tainted with blood, um, there'll be all kinds of unwanted population and the whole society will go to hell and so on and so on. He didn't want to, he, he got cold feet. So I, don't want to, I don't want to fight. So he put down his bow and arrows and you can see there's a picture on the wall over there in the corner. I don't know if you can see it very well from here, but um, Krishna is standing there and Arjun sitting on the chariot um, just, you know, his mouth is drying up. If you've ever had a situation where you're under a lot of stress, sometimes your mouth dries up. Okay, so he put down his arrows and he said, Krishna, I'm not going to fight. I, that, I, I just, I can't do it. I can't. But I can understand that I'm, I'm bewildered. I, 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 we've been wronged, you know, the, uh, the, what happened leading up to this particular point that they were um, the ruling party that took over they were harassing them so in spite of all that Arjun's like you know they're all these are they're all my kinsmen you know I can't do it but I can understand that I'm I, I should so okay 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 tell me what should I do Tell me what the best thing, what, 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 what should I do? And I, I surrender myself to you. Now I'm your disciple. We're not more, forget the friendship right now. You're, I, I accept you as my guru. You're, you please instruct me. What should I do? So the first thing that Krishna told Arjuna is, well, you're talking like a learned man, but what you're saying is ridiculous. What you're saying is what you're saying is foolish. What are you talking about? Because actually, Krishna put Arjun into a state of illusion so that he could speak what he wanted to speak for the rest of us. Arjun knew all these things. What we're going to hear in Bhagavad Gita, Arjun already knew all this. Okay. As a warrior, um, they have a guru. And they learn these things from a young age. 
you know, the fact that the soul is eternal and the body isn't. And all, all the other spiritual truths that Krishna is going to speak to Arjuna is just using Arjuna as a sounding board. Because the Bhagavad Gita is meant for us. Those in the future who do not understand this. Okay, so this was kind of a setup. <laughs> okay, so Krishna is explaining these essential spiritual truths. Right? So, a few verses before, text 11, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna said, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for that which is not worthy of grief. For wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. Okay? In other words, you're talking foolishly, Arjun. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead because the, later, as he's explaining, the soul is eternal. He says, ne Krishna says, never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. Okay, he's not just talking about the immediate future. He's talking about for all time. We always exist. We don't stop existing. Okay? Just because our body passes away doesn't mean that we stop existing. That's what Krishna is explaining. Okay? Then this verse, number 13, he says, as the embodied soul continually passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such a change. Okay? So for our benefit, okay, we are eternal beings, and yet we have somehow entered this body, which is temporary. Okay? And then Krishna goes on in this chapter, and this is uh, chapter two is the contents of the Gita summarizes. This is basically again the the what he's going to speak about, right? You 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 begin a, a lecture, and so you, okay, you, you present an outline, okay, an outline of what you want to say, and as the lecture goes on, that all the details get filled in, okay. He says, "Our best among men, Arjun." A person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress and is steady in both is certainly eligible for liberation. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there is no endurance, and of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. That which pervades the entire body you should know to be indestructible. No one is able to des destroy that imperishable soul. The material body of the indestructible, immeasurable, and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight, O descendant of Bharat. He's, Krishna is trying to enthuse Arjuna to fight. Okay? Neither he who thinks the living entity the, the slayer, nor he who thinks it slain, is in knowledge. For the self slays not, nor is slain. And he goes on like that. There's no birth nor death at any time. It's not coming to being. Never came into being. We never. We are. We are eternal. In other words. So the the point is that the Bhagavad Gita is telling us things that, by our own empirical endeavor, we cannot know. How, how, you know? Do we have people? Uh, you know, we have, of course, near death experiences. People say that they've died and this happened. They went through the light of the tunnel and. You know, some went to hell, some went to heaven, you know. Um, but there are many things that you can't know by yourself. You can't know by science. Okay? We say that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. And that's what it says in the scripture. Okay? If you want to know who your father is, uh, well, you can do it scientifically. You want to test every man in the world and see if the DNA <laughs> matches, right? Or you ask your mom. Duh. You ask your mom. So the scriptures are compared to your mother. And you want to understand who the Supreme Father is? You go to the scripture. And there it says, 
that there is a supreme being, a God, who is that person um, who is the supreme Lord. Okay? But because something happened before your birth, you can't know empirically through your senses. So, <laughs> you have to have faith. Oop, I said the, said the wrong word. I said the F word. Okay? You can't advance without faith. So, what does that mean? Will we just blindly follow somebody? You know, like Jim Jones? Right? You have to have faith. But faith from whom? Right? We all went to school. We had faith in the teachers. Okay? The teacher may not be Einstein, but he's teaching what Einstein came up with. So you accept it. You may not be able to perform those you know, atomic experiments or, or derive the, the formulas equals, E equals mc squared and know what that means. But you have to have faith in someone who can give you the knowledge. Okay? So that's the nature of the world. You can't live without faith, but we don't want to admit that. The scientists don't want you to believe that. Okay? They, I'm not saying all scientists, but in many scientists, they're trying to, in other words, prove that there's no need for a god. That's just archaic. Why do we need some supreme being? We can control all the things we need. To, you know, we're creating life in our test tube, right? We're creating the amino acids for the building blocks of life, and we're controlling the weather. We control this. We control that. And in, you know, if even if we can't control it, we're trying. Um, there's no need for a, a supreme being. That's just—it's not scientific. You know, we we you know we can't get God to come and you know into our test tube. Okay. But we're all relying on faith anyway. You, you put your foot on, you have faith that the the floor is not going to give way. Okay. But where to put your faith? Real faith, and not blind faith. Something reasonable. Okay. We have a Hare Krishna movement. What do we do? We chant Hare Krishna. Well, what is that all about? Well, it's, these are names of God, and you, you chant Hare Krishna, and you begin to purify your heart, you purify your mind, and you begin to realize these spiritual truths. Well, you know, I can't say so many words, you know. Chant, 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 can't, can't, can't. <laughs> right? Um... They won't do it. But um, we've done it. I tried it. And it works. If you do things properly, okay, even if you chant in a, in a humorous way or you know, whatever way your mind wants to make it, you still get benefit. But we have 10 rules that we follow when we chant to make it effective, to make it more effective, okay? Just like you're, if you're sick, you take some medicine, but if on the other hand you're doing the same thing that caused you to get sick, it's going to take a while, okay? So we have certain rules. We, we, uh, we don't eat meat. We don't uh, take intoxication. Uh, we don't have illicit sex, and we don't gamble, okay? Those things counteract the effects of chanting the mantra. And also, we have other, other uh, um, rules that we follow, that the chanting is not a mundane vibration. It's not like some pious activity. Um, we should not disobey the orders of the spiritual master. There's 10 offenses in chanting the holy name. So in any way you do it, there is, there is benefit. And that, in the beginning, it takes just a little bit of faith to try it, right? We want to, we have this association because we're trying to maintain our faith. We're trying to increase our faith. We're trying to become more and more convinced because the people on the outside are in a state of illusion. 
we're all under illusion. We're all under this illusion of maya. But the process of getting free from this illusion, that's what Bhagavad Gita is all about. Okay? In Western society, the concept of liberation, I, I mean, I've never heard about liberation. Did anybody go to school, the public school, and taught, and taught about liberation? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember any talk like that. Okay? But in other countries, like India, the concept of liberation is there. Okay, well, what does it mean to be liberated? I mean, you know, we talk about liberation in the terms of, you know, war protests or, you know, politics or something like that, right? Free, willy, you know, whatever, okay? But what is real liberation? Women's liberation, you know, what is real liberation? The liberation is getting back to our real self and living in a condition where we're not threatened by things that are temporary. There is a spiritual world. And Krishna talks about it in the Bhagavad Gita. It's all, everything is in here. Okay? If you read this one book, that's all you need. Okay? And it's interesting because there's a storyline. In, in the beginning, it's because we didn't read the, Mah the Mahabharata. Okay? There is an introduction, of course, in the, in, the, in the beginning of the book to kind of orient things. And it's a little difficult in the beginning because there are some names that a lot of them start with D, D-H, you know, like Dharma. Now that, you know, Dharma and Greg. <laughs> so, um, the Sanskrit words and these sort of things are a little bit confusing in the, in the beginning. But later on, as you read a little bit, you don't have to, Bhagavad Gita is, although it has a storyline, you don't have to read it like a novel. Okay, you can just read a, a paragraph or two, that's what I used to do, just read a paragraph or two and read the, the explanation, what we call a purport. Okay, so Srila Prabhupada makes it very clear in his purports what they're talking about. Okay, there are simply, you can find lots and lots of versions of Bhagavad Gita in the bookstore. What's the difference? Okay. The difference is that a pure devotee of Krishna, our spiritual master, who's sitting here, um, his murti form, um, explains everything in English from the Sanskrit, which is, of course, a dead language. Okay. To become expert in Sanskrit, just for example, Sanskrit is a, a language which predates all of the other languages of the world, in, including uh, Latin. But it's no longer used. It takes 12 years to learn the grammar, right? So we go to grammar school. I went to grammar school, I don't know, K through six, right? So by the time you finished high school, then you know grammar, okay? So Sanskrit is not an easy language to learn. But it is it's also known as the language of the gods. And it is a perfect uh, language. So Srila Prabhupada has taken this Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit and translated into English. Not only translated into English, every word is translated and you can pronounce it. Like if you, I don't know if you're not seeing what I'm seeing, but the actual Sanskrit um, you know, script but you can, and we started the, the lecture by reciting the, um, the Sanskrit mantra by a, a, a transliteration. I don't know Sanskrit, okay. But then they have a word-by-word word synonym and then a translation and then a purport, okay. So Srila Prabhupada did this for not only Bhagavad Gita, but for many, many other Sanskrit literatures, which are extremely important and profound for human beings. And he brought some of those literatures from India in 1965. He, he translated, uh, printed, okay, and then came here, he came to the United States with these books to enlighten uh, the people of the Western countries in the English-speaking world, okay. So... This is something that is a, uh, considered a jewel, the jewel of India. 
You think about India. It's like, well, in a third world country, there are so many millions of people over there, and they're all starving. And you know, if you go there, you know, the cities are overcrowded, and blah blah blah. So a lot of people come from India, they come to the West um, for economic development or for, for, for to find a job or or whatever. Okay, Srila Papa did not come here begging for anything. He came with the culture of India, the, the ancient culture of India, to introduce into the Western countries. And the premier book was Bhagavad Gita, as it is. Okay. The other Bhagavad Gitas did not make any devotees. You read Bhagavad Gita from anyone else, they'll admit it's a great mystery. Srila Prabhupada came and gave us the key to the mystery. And that is that you should devote your life to God, Krishna. Become a devotee. And learn from these literatures what human life is all about. It's not, a, it's not an armchair type of religion. That we simply come together like a theosophical society and talk about things. It is a way of life. It's something you do moment by moment in your life. And ultimately, Krishna explains to Arjun, if you do this, then there's all victory. There's all, everything is, is um, achievable. In this world, we're all trying to be something, right? You want to be something extraordinary. Somebody wants to play guitar and become the rock star. And somebody wants to be a great scientist or a great singer or, or a scholar or wh whatever it is they want. Okay. Anyone who is interested in Krishna consciousness okay, can become an extraordinary person. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here. I have no extraordinary qualification. I was an engineering, engineering student once upon a time. I'm just some dumb guy. So why am I sitting here? <laughs> you all can walk out if you want. <laughs> but I've learned something from my spiritual master, and I'm simply repeating it. And if you do that, whatever you've heard, for, you know, you can explain to your friends. So guess that what that makes you. Now you're... You're a guru. Okay? You're spreading something. You're increasing the knowledge of someone. As you're explaining it to somebody, I, I even remember when I was a Christian, you, you give away your uh, Christ consciousness, but you don't lose it. You, you're, you increase it and maintain it yourself. If you were trying to explain it to somebody, not only they benefit, but you benefit too. Just like anything you learn. If you teach somebody, you know, you, you learn math and you teach it to somebody, but then your, your understanding becomes more and more firm. Right? So Krishna consciousness is for everyone. And if you want to really understand Krishna consciousness, try to explain it. Read the books. There we have these books for sale, Bhagavad Gita as it is. We have other literatures. Um, Tune in to the, the temple broadcast. Listen to the lectures. Okay? And that is how Krishna consciousness will spread. When, you're, when you become Krishna conscious, then you can make the whole world Krishna conscious. One person came from India in 1965, and 12 years later, he circled the globe 14 times. While we were sleeping, he translated so many books. One person made the whole world Krishna conscious. I mean, okay, we have Christianity, you know, 2,000 years ago, Christ came, you know. And I'm not uh, uh, criticizing or belittling anything that Jesus did, but Srila Prabhupada did thousands of times more than Jesus was able to do at the time. Jesus had a dozen disciples. Prabhupada had 10,000. Jesus didn't write any books. Srila Prabhupada wrote so many books, 60 books, 400 pages each, while we slept. Okay, I just, I just turned 70. 
Prabhupada came to this country when he was 70. I can't imagine going to a foreign country uninvited, trying to present something of, let's see, let's go to New York and tell people not to have illicit sex, not to gamble, right? No uh, intoxication, no meat eating. You think, Prabhupada said, I thought maybe if people would just tell me to go home. <laughs> Well, how, you know, you're gonna you're gonna tell that to, to to people whose whole life is based on these things. And he, didn't, you know, if anybody says that that he was just in the right place at the right time, well, he was in the right place at the right time. But he was he was bold. He was bold. He he didn't ask. He came. And he he performed austerities that we can't imagine. He almost died on the way over here, on a on a steamer ship. Okay, so it almost reads like a fairy tale. The true Papad came, and if you we weren't here and saw what he was doing, you'd think it was impossible for any human being to do what he did. It was impossible. But he did it because he had full faith in Krishna. He had full faith in his spiritual master, and he was simply trying to do what his spiritual master asked him to do. And because he was a pure devotee, he had no other uh, ulterior motive. He wasn't coming here to get something. He was giving, coming here to give us something, to give us Krishna. And because he loved us. The Christians say the same thing. Jesus loved us you know, so much, right? Because Prabhupada loved Krishna and Prabhupada loved us. You couldn't help yourself. You just, you, you just swept up. So right now in, the, in, the, in, in Krishna consciousness movement, it's very new. Okay? We're the, not only me, but everyone in this room, people are listening. To, this is the, the, the vanguard. This is the, the crest of the wave that's going to take over the world. But it's new. Okay, when it we're, we're not exactly mainstream, although a lot of devotees would like to be mainstream. Um, it's mainstream in India, <laughs> Krishna consciousness, but the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, Srila Prabhupada's contribution, is completely pure. There's no motivation. It's not like we're trying to get something or trying to make business or anything like that. Okay, we're pu publishing books and selling them, but that's transcendental. Okay. So, in our own life, we can be Krishna conscious. We can work, have family, um, do all the things that ordinary people do. But just like in India, the, the ladies carry the water. They go down to the river, and they fill up their jar, or urn, or whatever, and they put it on their head. And while they're carrying it, they're, they may be doing other things. So that's the example given. This thing. We can be Krishna conscious and still be doing the so-called mundane things that we need to do as human beings. So at the same time, we need to um, read Srila Prabhupada's books, listen to his lectures. We're very, very fortunate that with the technology that we have videos and, and tapes and everything, you can see Srila Prabhupada in, in action. And I was lucky to be in his personal presence at some time. Um, I don't have a Oh, there's a clock. When am I supposed to stop? <laughs> I'm sorry? Ten minutes to seven. So when am I supposed to... Balaram, when am I... <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, go ahead. If there's any questions or comments... Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, <clears throat> well, that uh, Krishna took Arjun to the uh, down to the battlefield to see who was going to fight, and you mentioned that his guru was there, his uh, grandfather, uh, his cousins, so many people he knew, family members, teachers. But who was on Arjun's side? Who was on Arjun's side? Yeah, didn't Arjun have some family members on his side and? Yeah, so, well, I was just wondering if you could make some balance there, you know, because 
we don't know, you didn't, didn't tell us who was on Arjun's side. Well, of course, Arjun um, had, you know, people that, you know, he was allied with. Um, I couldn't tell you the names. Well, he had his brothers. Yeah, he, has, he, has, he had four other brothers. And his son, Abhimanyu. Uh, yeah, Abhimanyu. And Garukach. Garukach is Bhima's uh, son. Okay. So he had, he had his whole in intimate family on his side. So it wasn't just Arjun killing family members. Right, 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 right. And thank teachers. You. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, the, the, you know, he, he, had a, he had an army and uh, quite a uh, well-schooled army. Because one of the, in, in, in the previous chapter, the way the, the Bhagavad Gita begins is very interesting. The, the situation is that the cousins that Arjun had, these hundred uh, brothers, they were sons of a, a king. It was actually his uncle, um, his father's brother, but the king was blind. So if you've ever heard of remote viewing, I think the Pentagon you try, you tries to train people into remote viewing. You can see things going on in some other place. The king had a mystic named Sanjaya. And Sanjaya was empowered to see what was going on as, as if like in modern day we had a closed circuit TV. So our, the, during, uh, this blind king had this mystic telling him what was going on on the battlefield while the king was sitting in the palace away from the battlefield, somewhere else. So it's very interesting. So the king is asking Sanjay, what's going on? Who, you know, who is, who is fighting, right? Who is, you know, and, and detail by detail by detail, this whole thing is being narrated to the king by this mystic yogi, Sanjaya. So in the, in the beginning, Okay, his the the um, the head of the uh, the opposing army. I'm saying Arjun's on one side and uh, the opposition of Arjun. The head of that army was Duryodhan. He's the main uh, uh, main character on the other side. So as the uh, armies are assembling, then. Duryodhana's looking over there at the other army, Ar Arjun's army, and going, oh my gosh, OMG. Um, these, this is a very dangerous situation. Because, and he's talking to um, the military commander, Dronacharya, who happens to be Arjun's teacher. Okay, very strange situation. The teacher of Arjun is on the other side. He's fighting against Arjun. But that's another story. Another This backstory of Mahabharata is just unbelievable. If you start reading it, you can't put it down. It's like war and peace on steroids. I mean, it's just like unbelievable. So Duryodhana is telling Dronacharya, wait a minute. Um, I'm seeing this military arrangement, you know, kind of like the Super Bowl, right? They, they, they line up on either side and, you know, they run around this way, run around that way. Anyway, kind of like a military. Okay, the military did the same thing in the in the Gulf War. So he's he's starting to freak out. He's like, wait a minute, this is this is a military arrangement. Look at this. Okay, and he's kind of chastising Dronacharya because Dronacharya is like the military commander for the opposition of Arjun. And he's like, well, your disciple arranged all this. I mean, <laughs> this is dangerous, okay? You trained this guy, okay? So even though the, the Arjun had a small, a small, much smaller army, in the end, actually, Krishna said, in the course of Bhagavad Gita, he said, none of these soldiers are going home on either side, on either side. Hold on to your hat, 640 million Soldiers died, and it only took 18 days. 
There was so much blood, it created lakes. And now as you go there, there are lakes there, but in the beginning, they were, it was blood. Okay, this was a battle, you know, on a level that we can't imagine. We can't imagine God. Okay, so this was very, very significant. So again, the fact that all these backstories came together, okay, was really meant for one thing, this conversation right here. How to understand the spiritual truth of life. Because everyone's going to die anyway. That's what Krishna is telling Arjuna. He says, look, <laughs> they're going to die. Why, why are you worried about it? Because, you, you know, in this particular purport, we, we were reading, saying that, that uh, Arjuna was worried about Bhishma Dev, who was his grandfather, and, and other people he, he was related to. But Krishna is saying, they're going to die anyway. And they'll probably go to heaven, or they'll, maybe they'll go back to the spiritual world. So don't worry about it. Okay, but there was, because most of us need this knowledge, it's like there's so many different things. There's different kinds of yoga. There's different kinds of understanding. You have people who are, you know, scholarly. There's, you know, there's something for everybody in this book. So it doesn't matter what, what position you have in life, whether you're a boy or a girl, whether you're a warrior or an engineer or a businessman or whatever you might be, this is quintessential knowledge for being a human being. That's what this is. Okay? And Srila Prabhupada, by his inconceivable mercy and compassion to come here at great personal expense, give us something that we had no idea about, at least in the Western countries. So we are indebted to his divine grace for coming here. And uh, he's set the example. He was the world acharya. Acharya means someone who sets, uh, behaves by example. He didn't ask us to do anything that he wouldn't do. Okay? So uh, I ask everyone to uh, read some of his literature. Uh, try to assimilate it. Chant Hare Krishna, which we're going to do, I guess, in a few minutes. Any other questions? Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, we have one more? Okay, we have a question. Ask. Um, so my question is, so when you do um, praying or listening to Prabhupada when you're doing other things, doesn't it seem kind of superficial and not heartfelt? So how do you like pray or like listen to it heartful and not like on the outside but not feeling it inside. Um, I guess maybe because of the mask I'm having a lot of trouble understanding. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, when you pray to Krishna or when you listen to Prabhupada, it kind of feels superficial when you do it with other things, like with mundane things, as you said. And um, so how do you do it heartfelt and not like superficial, not like on the outside, but felt on the inside too? The, when you do things, okay, let's suppose you make some, some money, um, you can make a donation. If you grow flowers in the garden, you can bring them to the, to the temple. Um, as far as sincerity, if you simply do, try the chanting and, and, and read the books, okay, then while you're working, if you're working, then you can give some of the result of your work to help the movement somehow. We, we all have to do something. And Krishna says, you know, whatever you do, whatever you offer and give away should be a, a sacrifice for me, okay? So how do we do that on the outside? Well, um, like I say, even if you're just struggling to make it here, you know, as, as you have come tonight, that's that's your sincerity. It's it's not uh, it's not artificial, and you know sometimes they say you know fake it till you make it, right? So you chant, 
uh, okay, maybe I've, my mind's in so many other places. Uh, but if you simply do it, then Krishna fills in. Krishna says, I, I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. Okay? So we're all, you know, on our way. Some, some of us have made a little progress. Some of us made less. Some of us made a lot more. Uh, but ultimately, Krishna is the goal. Krishna is the goal. And we, along the way, we, we, again, all those rules and regulations, um, you can't give up something unless you have something better. Okay? You take candy from a baby, he's going to cry. Right? But if you give, a, give him something better to eat, then, you know, um, he'll go along with it. So, for myself, you know, I, I was doing a lot of things uh, against our principles, but I started chanting Hare Krishna, and I, I, I felt something. I felt like there's, a, there's some, really something to this. And so if you simply try that, um, I, I, I dare someone to say they tried it and it didn't work, because if you are sincere, I mean, it depends on your sincerity. If you are sincere, you will have the result. And you put oxygen and hydrogen together and put a spark, it'll make water. Okay, so if you chant Hare Krishna, you'll find that you become happy. <laughs> Just how it is. We're part, of, we're part and parcel of Krishna. Krishna's name and Krishna are the same. There is no difference at all. And just like putting a fish back in the water, the fish will never be happy out of the water. It's not possible, <laughs> right? So, you know, we want to have a relationship with Krishna, but the problem is that we have precluded that because we have, unfortunately, we left the spiritual world. We were with Krishna once upon a time, but we rejected him because we wanted to be Krishna. We wanted to enjoy like Krishna. Instead of being Krishna's servants, we wanted to be. The, and here's this place over here, this material world that we can go, and, and we're superior to matter, so we can, we can lord it over matter. So here we are. We came here. And unfortunately, the rest of the story is that you have to have a body. And Krishna makes all this arrangement. He makes all this arrangement. Then he, he hides himself behind the matter. He hides, he hides because we don't want to see him. So there's a, you know, trying to preach, no matter what religion you're in, if, it, it's difficult because the reason we're here, it's like going to a, a prison and, and trying to see what a nice guy the governor is. Well, that's probably not going to go over very well because you're rebelling against the government and the, the, the governor re is the government. So trying to say nice things about God, well, we don't want God. And scientists are trying to, you know, come up with reasons why there isn't one. Or we can, sub, you know, supersede God. We don't need God. We don't need this backwards concept that we made up. Okay? So there's many, many pitfalls because our sincerity, you know, is in the, is in the making. We, we really want to enjoy. We're, we're, we're enjoying creatures. That's natural for the soul to want to enjoy. But we're trying to enjoy our senses and things that are connected with our senses. And that doesn't bring happiness. That's the problem. And we just don't want to admit it. We go from one thing to the next, and watch the Super Bowl, uh, go for a boat ride, do this, that, you know, all the things with the anticipation of enjoyment. But the enjoyment is here and then it's gone. As well, we'll do it again. But it's never the same. Right? I was. I, my, my dad bought a boat, right? So we went sailing in the boat. Oh, it's nice. Okay? Then we want to go again. But it's somehow it's not the same. And sometimes enjoyment just happens. You just somehow or other, it, well, it just feel good for some reason. No, nothing in particular happened. Or sometimes you work really, really hard. And, you, you know, I was going, on a, I was going to go camping. Filled up my, my camper with everything. I got two blocks down the highway. <laughs> a car broke down. <laughs> you know, so I guess I'm not immune. But anyway, so that this is the way the material world works. 
you can't find permanent satisfying happiness here. It just doesn't exist. Okay. So now, now that you're a human being, you can learn there is another existence where everyone is eternal. There is nothing temporary there. Everyone's fully happy and satisfied. Right? And they're in love. They're in love with God. Okay, never mind the, God, the word God. They're in love with Krishna, a person. Fancy that. Krishna's a person. He's beautiful. He's attractive in every way. And you can have every living entity has a relationship with Krishna that way they've forgotten in the material world. We've simply forgotten it. So all we have to do is revive it. And there's a process. It's not just overnight. It's like you want you find a new friend or a boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay, it takes a while to establish a relationship. So we have to reestablish our lost relationship with Krishna. And basically that entails, again, serving Krishna. We like to, serving Krishna means hearing and chanting and serving and praying and uh, giving things up to Krishna. There are nine devotional processes. So when you're reading about Krishna, you're serving Krishna. You come to the temple, you eat prasadam, you're serving Krishna. You listen to the lecture, you're serving Krishna. Okay? And it, when you walk away, it's like, wow, I, I feel really good. <laughs> I'm really glad I came to the temple. I'm really glad that I heard these things. Right? And that's the proof. And as we go on and on, eventually we will become pure devotees. And we will live with Krishna without end. That's the real truth. That's the goal of life. Okay. So in the meantime, okay, some of us want to go faster. Some of us want to lollygag for a while. It's up to you. So, Hare Krishna. Profound. Thank, Thank you, you Prabhu Manaprabhu. How are you all? Well?